I'm an urban explorer, and I'll never forget what I found in an abandoned factory. By U slash Neptune, narrated by Miss Creepy Tales. My name is Wyatt. I'm 21 now, but this story happened last winter when I was still 20. I am an urban explorer and nature photographer. That is about as much detail I'll go into about myself because I don't want anybody coming after me if they found out what I've seen. I know, I will never forget what I saw, but I can't risk telling anyone that I know. I am not currently under any immediate danger, but there are too many unknowns. Back in early December of last year, I was looking through Instagram and saw some shots from an abandoned factory in Germany. This place was so perfect. It was rusting and old but still kept the same structure and shape as when it was in use. Some of the pictures were breathtaking, mountain views through decrepit old windows, things like that. I screenshotted and reverse image searched one of the pictures from Instagram and found a place in Germany. There was no name for the factory anywhere I looked, but I kept seeing the town it was in was called Westgen. I looked it up on Google Earth and saw that it was a mountainous region in northern Germany and as I swiped through the images on Google, one article stopped me. It claimed that the factory was going to be demolished in April of next year, meaning it would be gone in just a few months. I was feeling impulsive and excited, so without thinking, I googled flights to Berlin. Looking back, I wish my phone would have died at that very moment anything to stop me from looking at flights. I would do anything to go back and make me close that tab. However, I found one flight leaving from my airport that Wednesday, and it was only $600. I was just about to buy the tickets when I remembered that my friend Bryce, which is not his real name, was looking for somewhere to go for winter break. So, I called him up and told him that there were tickets to Berlin for $600. I wish he would have talked me out of it, but instead, he was all over the idea. Later that afternoon, we both bought our tickets and planned to leave on Wednesday. Adrian, also not his real name, was also coming with us, but was going to leave early on Saturday to go see his family in Poland. Me and Bryce made plans to go to West Gen on Sunday and look around there for a few hours. So when Wednesday came, I packed all of my stuff, camera lenses, SD cards, respirator, flashlights, clothes, and met up with Bryce and Adrian. And we took an Uber to the airport and quickly boarded the plane. Honestly, I don't remember most of the flight. I think I slept through most of it. But finally, we arrived in Berlin. Honestly, for the next few days, it was just a normal vacation, nothing but sightseeing and doing basic tourist things. On Saturday, we said our goodbyes to Adrian and he left for Poland. That night, I made sure to get all my stuff ready for the next morning. We had a two-hour car ride from Berlin to Westchen. I was hoping we would get there around 2 in the afternoon and explore until about 8 that night. Playing it back in my head, I remember every little detail of that day. I remember the sound of my alarm, the excitement of waking up that day, the feeling of seeing all my stuff packed neatly on the floor next to my bed. We got up and had breakfast in the hotel lobby before walking to the car rental place. We picked out a blue Chevy from the lot and the guy gave us the keys. I spent the next few hours driving through the green rolling hills of Germany until we finally got there. I felt nothing but excitement, 
when we finally got into the town. I remember just driving and looking around for a while until we saw it there, clear as day, the abandoned factory. It sat at the bottom of a tall hill in the middle of a bright green field. The mountains were in the distance to the east opposite the factory. I started looking on Google Maps for a good place to park in order for us to walk there. There was a large parking lot next to a self-storage place that was only about a quarter mile from the factory. I pulled into one of the spots and looked around for people. Should be good, I told Bryce. I grabbed my camera bag, my flashlight, and my respirator out of the back seat and put it all on. For those of you who don't know, a lot of old buildings were built with toxic materials like asbestos, so it's just safer to not even risk it and wear the respirator. We began walking down this old crack asphalt road that has grass and flowers growing through it. It led straight to the factory which I remember finally having a good view of. It was brown and rusted, but still beautiful and majestic. It had plants growing in it, like it had been retaken by nature after the people left it. And after a little walking, we reached a tall chain-link fence that was locked. But there was no barbed wire on top, so I considered just jumping it. But instead, I decided to look for an easier way. After walking next to the fence, I saw part of it had been knocked from the metal frame by somebody else. We pushed the metal out of the way and just crawled through it onto the other side. Now, we just had to get into the factory. It was already clear to me that the main entrance wasn't an option. It probably had motion sensors anyway and I was looking around when I spotted it. A broken window. It was only about 10 feet off the ground, so I asked Bryce to help me up. He hoisted me up, and I grabbed onto the windowsill. I pulled myself up and threw the window frame, pushing aside the broken glass as I did so. I pulled Bryce up through the window, and we both jumped down on the ground inside a factory. Now, when I say this thing was massive, I mean massive, like probably the biggest single room I have ever seen. It had so many levels and catwalks and bridges. This place was a gold mine. I immediately got out my camera and put on my 16-35 to lens and my best flash. I also put in a new SD card just in case. We walked around the ground floor a bit, mostly just looking up at the ceiling, and I took one picture of all the catwalks and bridges leading up to the crack in the ceiling, letting sunlight through. We went up one of the staircases onto the second level. There were a ton of generators and turbines all over the place, with a thick layer of dust and rubble covering them. I took some pictures on this floor, but we quickly moved up to the next floor. It was more of the same stuff, but still beautiful. I walked to the edge of the floor and looked over the small balcony-like platform we were on. I immediately felt dizzy looking all the way down to the ground level. I'm used to that kind of stuff. I just didn't realize how high up we were. We climbed up the stairs to the next floor. When Bryce told me to look at the mountains out the window, that was the shot from Instagram that I wanted. I adjusted my settings and snapped the shot. I checked over them just to make sure it was good because that's pretty much the reason I came here. Even though I'm explaining this all very quickly, we did spend hours wandering around this place and looking at every little detail. We eventually got to some sort of control room. It must have had hundreds of different switches and buttons 
all labeled with German words that I couldn't read, or seemingly random numbers. It was made clear from a thick layer of dust that this stuff hadn't been used in decades, probably. That being said, I know I shouldn't have done this, but I took a small silver key from the control room as a souvenir. We left the control room and saw a ladder that went up at least two stories. It led straight up onto the roof of the factory. I hesitantly decided to climb it, but Bryce said he'd do it if I did it first. The ladder wobbled from side to side as I hesitantly climbed up the steel bars. And finally, I grabbed onto the roof and pulled myself up onto it. You'll be fine if you go slow. I yelled down at him. Soon, he joined me up on the roof and we looked out on the rest of the world. It was just endless rolling green hills leading to the snow-capped mountains. I turned around and looked behind us and realized that the hill behind us was taller than the factory itself. If we could get to that hill before sunset, the picture would be unbelievable. I really, really wish I had just abandoned the area, but instead, we rushed back down the ladder and all the staircases to the ground level. We quickly leapt out of the window and crawled through the fence, and we walked across the grassy green fields and slowly walked up the tall green hill. I won't lie, it was tiring walking all the way up that hill, raising the sunset, and when we finally got there, it was totally worth it. The factory, the mountains, and the sunset all mashed together in this beautiful vista. I took out my tripod and lined up the composition. When I finally snapped the shot, I took nine or ten of the same exact picture just to make sure I got it. It was incredible. But if I could, I would go back in time and leave that hill immediately. And unfortunately, Bryce looked behind us and pointed out another abandoned building to me. It was smaller, made of brick rather than steel. He was hesitant to go down there and checked it out because it was getting late. I assured him we would be fine with the flashlights and we wouldn't be long. We walked back down the other side of the hill and over to the dilapidated brick building. By the time we got there, it was getting pretty dark already, but we had flashlights that worked fine. The only weird thing was that when we walked up to it, the gate was unlocked, like they weren't even trying to keep people out. I guess it was pretty hard to find, but still. We walked straight through the gate, and I was scanning the area for motion sensors or alarms, but there was nothing. The same exact thing when we got to the front door. No lock, no bar, nothing. We moved open the metal door, but it was heavy, hard for either of us to even move. We entered the building, and it was dark. Super dark. I immediately had to turn on my flashlight to even be able to see. The building looked more of the same, catwalks, machines, and the overall same vibe. But there was a large circular door directly in front of us. It looked more like an entrance to a bank vault than any normal door you would find. At this point, I was stunned that we hadn't seen a single alarm or motion sensor in this place. We were both immediately drawn to the vault door, and I put my hand on it in awe. I had never seen anything like this in all places that I have explored. It was barely cracked open, not open all the way, but definitely not closed. I put my hand in between the door and the wall and tried to pry it open. It slowly moved open showing us what was inside, 
There was a long circular tunnel that just led to another room. So far, this was looking like one of the best finds for me ever. I took multiple pictures looking down that long hallway, the flash lighting up the area, and we slowly walked down the hallway, flashlights in hand as we advanced towards the room at the end. When we got to the end of the hallway, there was another vault door that was swung all the way open. We walked through the open door into the room. It was seemingly empty, except for a small hatch leading into the ground. It was closed, but the lock and chain on it were broken. Above it, there was an arrow pointing at the hatch that said, Projekt Nachtwolfen. At that time, I had no idea what it meant. I didn't even take a second to put it into Google Translate. Nowadays, the words still send a chill down my spine. Project Nightwolf. A phrase that sounds like nothing, but if you had seen what I've seen, you wouldn't be able to hear those words without shuddering. I slowly opened the hatch, the hinges squeaking as I did so. I flipped it all the way over until it was on the other floor. I shined my flashlight down the hatch to reveal what looked like just a normal staircase. We began slowly descending down the stairs, and as we got closer to the bottom, you could hear the drops of water hitting the floor and making a quiet sound. I was going first, ahead of Bryce, so I saw it first. A room that was all pitch black, with about two inches of water lining the whole floor came into my sight. What horrified me were the piles of animal skeletons and bones lying in the water, small rodents that had been mutilated, and sheep that had been torn apart. Some were just the skeletons, but others still had decaying, rotten flesh, but it looked like they had been ripped apart, some of them torn perfectly in two. I struggled to hold back my vomit as the smell hit me. I was firing off my camera flash taking pictures all around us when I spotted another door just ahead of us. I remember Bryce telling me that we should just leave, but I wanted to go to that last door. The room was made out of cement. Stone pillars sat around the room, although some of them looked like they were about to collapse. We finally got to the door and I opened it and it looked like just another control room, like the ones in the factory. The thing that was different, though, was there was swastikas on a lot of the equipment and walls. Not ones that had spray-painted on by some kids, but real-looking ones. It was as if this place hadn't been touched since World War II. I looked around at some of the buttons and stuff until I saw a journal. I opened it to find that unsurprisingly it was in German, but I stuffed it in my pocket to take home. Just then, I heard the sound of broken glass. Not like somebody dropping a wine glass, but like an entire window was just shattered all at once. I immediately turned off my flashlight and Bryce slammed the door behind us. We both knelt down, breathing as silently as possible, not wanting to know what that sound was. Thoughts rushed through my head, possibly a bird, a mountain lion, but neither of those were even possible. We sat in that room for about a full minute until I realized that it was probably just because of how old this room was. Some structural error, or rotting metal, probably caused it. I worked up enough courage to go out there, and Bryce said that he would go if I opened the door first. I walked over to the door still crouched on the ground, and I turned the handle. I slowly creaked the door open, and as if we were in a horror movie, 
my flashlight died. I was too committed at this point to go back, so I did the only thing I could think of. I grabbed my camera and started blindly firing off the flash. I could only do it about every three seconds, but I slowly creep further and further out into the room. And that's when I saw it. It looked like a shadow crouched on the ground, but about ten feet away from me was this oily, black, skeleton-like creature. It slowly stood up, making cracking and crunching sounds as it did so. Its limbs snapped back and forth like they were breaking, and when it finally got all the way up, I saw its mangled set of razor-sharp teeth lighting a huge gash in its face. It was at least nine feet tall with its head almost hitting the ceiling. It was holding the body of a fox in its lanky, disguising arms. It ripped the fox into two as it let out a horrifying, ear-piercing screech. My flash stopped firing, and I looked down at my camera to see the message. SD card full. I quickly grabbed the one in my pocket and switched them out, but when I fired the flash again, the creature was gone. Had I just imagined it, I felt paralyzed when suddenly it grabbed me by my neck. Its hand felt wet and sharp as it pulled me towards it. Bryce immediately ran for the door, and I don't blame him for it. I was panicked. No rational thoughts ran through my brain except one. Survive. As I was brought closer to its face, I grabbed the pocket knife from my right pocket and plunged it deep into the neck of the creature. It dropped me and let out a horrifying scream. My camera smashed on the floor and I felt Bryce grab my arm to pull me up. We bolted for the door and slammed it behind us. We could still hear it screaming and screeching as we ran up the stairs. When we got up the stairs and above the hatch in the floor, I tied a chain around the lock hoping it would give us more time. After that, we just sprinted back to our car. It was pitch black by that point, so when we got in the car, we sped off and didn't look back for a second. It was a very silent car ride back to the airport. We got on an earlier flight back home and left that night, and we didn't talk about what happened until we got back home. I didn't leave my room for the rest of that winter break. If it weren't for the journal and the pictures, I would have thought that I dreamt it, but no. The pictures showed the disgusting creature exactly how I remember it. And I'm glad that I switched out the SD cards or I would have no pictures of it. I won't post any of them here, mainly because I don't want people finding this place and making the same mistake that I did. But I will post a section from the journal that I was able to translate. Most of the journal is illegible, but I could make out this small section. Our tests have not been getting better. It has become even more violent, no longer eating the rabbits, but just tearing them apart. Nobody here wants to get into the cage with it anymore because of the fact that it seems to find joy in destroying the animals. Also the screaming. I will never forget the screaming until the day I die. March 24, 1942Eat His Flesh Written and narrated by Lady Spookaria I have found myself wondering whether I should share this with anyone. I found my grandmother's journal last week. It had been stored in the attic during the move to her new home. 
I'd gone over there to help her organize her things and to clean. I've always wanted to learn more about my family history. The book was leather-bound, written in cursive, and was pretty thick. She wrote in it regularly throughout her life. The paper was slightly different when new sections had been added. I settled down to read it one day. It started when she was nine years old. She spoke about her family, my great-grandparents and her siblings. It was pretty interesting to hear how she lived. She mentioned a friend of hers, her best friend, a small boy who lived across the street called Peter. Peter and her would frequently play together. It was pretty sweet. As I read, she wrote about her dreams and the rise of World War II, a war she lost both her father and her brother. She talked about the rationing, the bombs, and the stress of invasion. Yet, Peter remained consistent. I was curious as to why Peter was not called in to serve in either of the world wars. She didn't say. He was a regular feature in her writing. Otherwise, her childhood was quite unimpressive, so I'll skip to her teenage years. At first, I wondered whether or not Peter was a childhood ghost. A best friend, but it sounded like he aged as she did. She told me he grew tall and handsome. I felt a little strange reading this, and I knew I had no right to be. My grandfather's name was James, and I think she had a bit of a crush on Peter. She mentioned how her mother didn't approve of Peter, and by all accounts, I couldn't see the reason why. On the 13th of July, 1950, she began to have nightmares of a person watching outside her bedroom window. As I flicked through the pages, I noticed it was recurring and kept happening again and again. Each time, the figure became more and more clear. A black shadow with glowing eyes. When she spoke about it, her family told her to be quiet. There were many people in pain after the war ended and life was returning to normal. They figured it was just a nightmare. When I turned the page, I saw the drawing of the figure. The eyes stared up at me, and I instantly began to feel uneasy. I kept reading more about Peter and my grandmother. They went on several dates and were courting, essentially dating with marriage in mind, so to speak. I couldn't read her journal one night and needed some time to rest. I placed a bookmark inside, lay down in bed, and turned on some relaxing music to fall asleep to, and began to flip through my phone. I liked a few pictures, commented on a few things, when I noticed a reflection. It happened so briefly. There was a black shadow. When I blinked, it was gone. I laughed to myself and decided it was definitely time for bed. I curled up and slept. I found myself in an empty room. The white paint was peeling off the walls, and the door slammed shut behind me. I jumped, looked around, and thought I could see the shadow figure. Instead, I... I saw Peter exactly as my grandmother had drawn and described him. He stared at me, unblinking. There was a stillness about him that frightened me. He said nothing and I stepped backwards. That feeling would not disappear. I could see my breath and I shivered in the cold. When I looked for the door, I discovered it was gone. I turned around and looked for Peter, half expecting him to be standing behind me, but he wasn't there. I was still trapped inside the doorless and windowless room. I shivered and ran my fingers along the surface of the wall, trying to find a way out. As my pace increased, I felt my heart rate rise and I started to scratch at the wall, trying to find a way out. I needed to get out. 
I could feel eyes on me in the darkness, and I needed to get away from whatever it was. Please. Please. I begged to myself. I felt a breath on the back of my neck. My scratching became louder. I could feel both the wallpaper and my fingernails peel away. I felt fingers moving through my hair. I tried to scream and no sound came out. I kept imagining the shadow figure behind me, ready to grab me and hurt me. You need to run. A voice came from the opposite end of the room. I looked in the direction and saw an open window, the night sky bright and the moon illuminating the room. I turned and ran, not looking back into the dark, and leapt out the window. I felt my body fall through the air, and when I was about to land, I woke up in my bed, breathless and coated in sweat. It was nothing but a nightmare. I got up, showered and brushed my teeth before checking the dark circles under my eyes. They were darker than they usually were. I leaned in close to study my eyes. Something about them looked different. I decided to ignore it for the time being, got dressed and brushed my hair. All I could think about was continuing to read my grandmother's journal. I kept thinking about Peter, the nightmare I had, and I found myself drawn to it. I opened it, lifted the bookmark, and started to read again. My grandmother wrote that Peter would come over to her house at all hours of the day or night. That, on the odd occasion, she would see him standing inside her room, staring at her from the corner, silent and unmoving. I felt a feeling of dread. Why was I now seeing him? I kept reading, and surprisingly the next few paragraphs were relatively quiet, uneventful. She met my grandfather, James, and only considered him to be a friend. As I kept reading, my eyes were drawn to the corners of the room, and I had a feeling I was being watched. My vision began to blur, and I could barely focus on the words in front of me. I kept hearing whispers around me. They went on for a long while. The shadow with the glowing eyes kept watching me, circling, and I wondered just how my grandmother had managed to escape. I opened my eyes and saw Peter, exactly like his photograph exactly like how she had drawn him. He smiled at me. His face perfect, too perfect, and without any blemishment or sign of suffering. He didn't even look real. Eat it, 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 eat it. I reached out and placed my hands on either side of his cold cheeks, frozen to my touch, and leaned forward. My teeth sank into his skin, and he screeched in surprise. As I pulled away, I could taste the blood in the flesh. I chewed the raw meat, swallowed, and went in for the next bite. It was the best thing I had ever tasted. He didn't pull away. A feeble stop was all he muttered, and I continued to eat my fill. I gorged myself. My stomach bloated and soon fell into a dreamless sleep. When I woke up, I could feel something in my teeth and could taste the distinctive metal taste of blood. I opened my bedroom door to see my grandmother standing there. She pulled me into a loving hug and I accepted it. I was confused. I didn't hear her come in. Welcome to the family, darling, she whispered into my ear. It was my friend Parker that started it. Skin posting, that is. A blurry picture of what looked like the inside of her wrist appeared in all of our Instagram feeds captioned simply, Skin Post. 
I quickly scrolled past and shook my head, wondering why Parker always had to be so weird. Her brand of surreal humor sailed straight over the heads of everyone that knew her, and yet she always had a full factory production process of more incoming. When I logged on next, a few days later, I saw that there were a few more posts of extreme close-ups of people's faces, backs, and who knows where else. In the next hour, mine and everyone's feeds became saturated with skin. Some seemed to believe it was an odd body positivity trend. Others thought it was a statement for racial unity. My grandmother, who's always had a macabre sense of humor, posted a comment on one of them. Oh, is it the anniversary of Jeffrey Dahmer's death or something? I was getting weirded out by the whole thing. How the viral grip of bandwagoning spread like wildfire. I decided to call Parker. We hadn't talked in weeks, and I wanted to see what she thought about how much her random 3 a.m. post gained traction. Hey, girlfriend, she answered ecstatically. You'll never guess what happened. Three of the top 10 influencers on Instagram have started skim posting. She cackled loudly, and I had to take my phone away from my ear until she stopped. That's great, Parker. Who knew something like this would blow up so much? I replied severely less enthusiastic. This was suddenly the last thing I wanted to talk about. I'd seen enough skin to last me the rest of my life. Frankly, it freaked me out. Why would people do something so strange just for social media clout? So, I haven't seen a skin post from you yet. I just started a skin posting page on Facebook. Could you help me out with it? I've been the only poster so far. I need more contributors. I closed my eyes and squeezed the bridge of my nose. She wasn't going to take no for an answer, was she? I'm not really comfortable with that. Not really my thing, I sighed. Oh, come on, you owe me one. Ever since I saved your butt from that creeper at the bar. She let her words hang in the air until I answered. Sure, whatever. But this is the last favor you can milk for me on that. I'm using my alternate account, though. Thanks, sweetheart. I'll send you the link. I braced myself, strangely leery of taking one simple photograph. I decided to choose my neck zooming in the camera until all that could be seen was my skin. Maybe I was self-conscious about my body. Maybe this would be good for me. After I took the picture, the text with the link came and I switched accounts and posted it. It had a fake name and for when I wanted to comment or post without others being able to recognize me. The first comment came almost immediately from an account with no profile picture. It simply said one dollar. It gave me an uneasy feeling to say the least. I checked the account and saw the account had no posts, almost like it had just been created. $12 came the next comment from a different account. No profile picture on this one either. I couldn't help but watch, wondering where was this going? $300 and the numbers kept rising. I started getting message requests as well but I ignored those. It had been an hour, maybe two, but I just watched dumbstruck. With a burst of effort, I deleted the post and closed the app. That was enough internet for the day. I sat on the floor next to my couch with my phone on the floor next to me, thrown entirely off balance. What was wrong with these people, even if they were just joking? Anonymity does funny things to people. Could they be serious? I had no idea who these people were. I had always been paranoid, but it made no sense that people would be auctioning for my skin on a public social network. It wasn't the dark web or anything. Nevertheless, I was relieved I'd use an alternative account. My phone buzzed next to me, and almost with an audible sigh of relief, I checked it. My heart sank. Why did you delete your post from an unknown number? Then another text slid in with a ding. I will pay top dollar for your skin. $20,000. Final offer. 
I felt my heart starting to beat rapidly, the soles of my feet suddenly slick on the wooden floor. I don't know what you're talking about, I started typing. I think you have the wrong... When the next text came in like a brick to my gut. Felicia Jennings, 8852 Park Avenue, 21 years old. That right? They then began to list my birthday, social security number, and the name of my childhood dog. Come on, you'll never get a better offer, Felicia. You can live without your skin, especially with that kind of dough. I could almost imagine them laughing, thinking how dumb I must be to take them up on this deal. $50,000 right now, and I have the tools already. And then a picture of my front yard, and the new dent on my car clearly visible. A heavy knock on the door nearly gave me a heart attack. I leapt to my feet immediately, adrenaline propelling me through my bedroom door, over my bed, and under it on the far side. Dust bunnies on the wood floor scattered as I invaded their burrow. The stranger began banging on the door, the noise getting angrier and angrier until it seemed like it was throwing its body at the door in an attempt to break it off its hinges. And then silence. I cowered in the cramped space under my bed, wondering why I had the bright idea to store so much stuff here until the meaning of silence set in. While the man who wanted my skin had been knocking on the door, I could use the noise to determine his exact location. Now that he had stopped, however, and then I heard a tapping on the glass of my bedroom window, where I was hiding. I poked my head out from under the bed. I looked through the window, and what I saw, I saw a man, red in the moonlight. Not ruddy, not flushed with anger or effort. He shined a glistening crimson, muscles bared, steaming to the cold night air. His teeth were bared and his eyes were wild. I don't know if he even had lips to cover his teeth or even eyelids. Then he punched through the window. He jammed his arm forward through the window's glass and reached for me. His hands. Somehow I managed to leap from out from under the bed and ducked under his flailing arms and kept running. The tinkle of broken glass behind me told me that the man of red was climbing in after me. I wasn't safe here anymore and I needed to get away. I saw the open door to the basement and made a split-second decision to duck inside and inch it closed as quickly as I dared. I had no idea if there were more of them out there, salvering for just a piece of my skin to cover up their naked wrongness. Maybe that man, that thing would think I would run outside instead of into the basement, too excited for the chase to consider my hiding place. I clutched the cold doorknob tightly, there at the top of the darkened stairway, hardly daring to breathe. No quick thumps to show a quick pursuit in the wrong direction. Silence. And in that silence, I dropped my phone down the stairs. The clatter felt enough to wake the dead and I knew he had heard. The earnest thumps on the door began almost immediately, accompanied by a high-pitched, keening cry. The creature yearned so strongly for what I had taken for granted all my life. He could hardly contain himself, as if every second without it was agony. Perhaps it is. That doesn't mean I'm not going to brace myself up against this door until he breaks it down, or until help arrives. The police are on their way, but they're still 20 minutes out. This might be the last thing I ever write. Every impact jarring me as I frantically write my story. This might be the last thing I ever write. Every impact jarring me as I frantically write my story. I don't know why I'm writing this. Perhaps... Perhaps so I'll be remembered, or simply be ready for what is coming... I guess we'll see what I'll do with my $50,000. December 28th, 2021. So, I'm a New Yorker, but I've been stuck in Washington, the state, not the city, for more years than I like to admit. Growing up next to the Great Lakes, I'm no stranger to snow. 
I keep a shovel in my car from having to dig myself out at the end of a late shift from working at the mall back home. Back east, the amount of snowfall we've gotten in Washington would be laughable. I even sent pictures to my family on the Book of Faces, and we all had a good chuckle at how unprepared people here are for inclement weather. Me taking my minivan to empty parking lots to do donuts aside, I've run into a problem. One that doesn't just have to do with my abysmal work hours the past few weeks. I work with clients on an individual basis, but I'm sort of an independent contractor. My schedule for this week was mostly loaded with clients, which was great, until we started getting snow on Christmas night, and it hasn't really stopped since. We've only accumulated maybe six inches of snow over a few days, but that's enough to bring life as we know it to a screeching halt here in the Pacific Northwest, where the sun never shines. Unless it's the end of summer, and so intense for a few weeks that it literally sets everything on fire. This morning, I was excited that I finally had a client who didn't cancel on me. I made my typical commute to the clinic, getting there well before my appointment to prep everything for my client. My workplace is also a school, and due to the weather, any student appointments were canceled for that day. I'd been doing laundry and such for a bit when my other coworker rolled in. We were supposed to be working on a pair of family members with appointments at the same time. He and I chatted for a bit, and time wore on. The start time for the clients came and went without them showing up or notifying us of their intention to leave us high and dry. Joke's on them, since they now get to eat the cancellation fee. Better a few dollars for showing up than none. My coworker still had a few other upcoming appointments, so I clocked out and headed downstairs to grab my things. The clinic is in an old house with narrow, steep stairs and quite a few small rooms. It has charm, but I've always had a sinking feeling in my stomach when I descend into the basement, despite it being well lit and cheerfully decorated. You don't have to be a believer in the energy human beings emit to know that it exists. If you've ever met someone and instantly knew they were an unsafe person, you encountered another person's energy. I'm not here to argue about the existence of what we radiate. Just know that my line of work very heavily involves being fully immersed in the energy of others and helping them heal and work through negative experiences. Several other coworkers agree with me that the lower level of the clinic gives them the creeps because bad energy clings to locations like tar, but nothing seems particularly malevolent. Goosebumps are no biggie with some of the entities I've encountered in my lifetime. Heebie-jeebies from the basement aside, I grabbed my coat and bag. Ignoring the prickling sensation over my left shoulder of being watched, I ascended back to the main floor, bid my coworker goodbye, and trudged back through the untouched snow and the empty parking lot to my vehicle. The whole world around me was quiet, the air stiller than usual from the muffling blanket of snow that lovingly smothered everything. My drive home was fairly uneventful, until I was just a few blocks from my apartment. Typical of the strong winds here, all of the traffic lights were out at a four-way intersection just a few blocks from home. No big deal. Despite Washington drivers typically invoking madness in me, everyone was polite and treated the flashing signals like a four-way stop. Everyone moved through it safely. Back home at my apartment, I greeted my cats and killed the rest of the evening on the computer. I slept fairly well, which is saying something since I'm usually plagued by insomnia and nightmares. I should have known something was about to go extremely wrong. Morning came and I got ready for work as usual, making the drive through the laughable amount of snow to the clinic. It was odd that no other cars were in the parking lot. I knew students were also on the schedule today, but nobody was around. Shrugging it off, I headed inside and got my room prepped. 
Then I glanced at the schedule. It was for the previous day. Must be nobody printed off today's schedule, I muttered to myself. I was about to log into the computer to do so when my male coworker came in, greeting me in the exact same manner as he had yesterday. Something was off. I was going to give myself a migraine if I frowned any harder. I pinched the bridge of my nose and inhaled slowly. Is this some kind of weird joke? I asked, indignant. If it is, it's not funny. He carried on as if I hadn't spoken, responding only to the conversation we'd had yesterday, as if it were happening right now. I swallowed hard, not knowing what to say other than to roll along with the repeated back-and-forth banter. A cold knot formed in the pit of my stomach, and I stood watching the clock, waiting. As with the day before, my client didn't call, and never showed up. I glanced at the date on my phone, dread-twisting my insides as I saw that it was the same as yesterday. But... How is that possible? The lights in the basement flickered constantly as I retrieved my coat and bag. Whatever was causing this phenomenon I was experiencing, I knew that the unpleasant but non-malignant entity in the basement wasn't the source. I ignored it, slamming the locker door shut in frustration and stomping up the stairs. What else could I do? If every interaction with a person was like that with my coworker, nobody would believe anything I said, if they even heard my current words at all. I drove home, passing again through the intersection where the lights were all flashing. Once I arrived home, my cats were less affectionate than usual, seeming to be the only living beings aware that something was amiss. I vowed that I'd take a different route to work the next day, and hope this was all just a nightmare. December 28th, 2021. Day 13. Unfortunately, it wasn't a dream. It's been nearly two weeks of living the same day over and over again. I've tried everything to get time moving forward, but nothing works. Desperate on the sixth day, I'd wrench the wheel of the minivan as I went through the routine intersection, trying to crash it into other vehicles. My hands faded, became translucent before me, and a physical set of hands carried on with fingers firmly gripping the steering wheel. I screamed in frustration and fought and pulled at the wheel, to no avail. I pounded my fists against the dash, feeling hopeless and helpless. I ended up back at my apartment, with my cats growing more and more agitated with each day that passed. When I'm manipulating nothing other than my own body, I can slightly go off the track of the day. But if it involves any other living being or inanimate object, I can't deviate from the path fate has me super glued to. And aside from the cats slowly devolving from snuggly balls of fluff to standoffish hissing messes, the world around me continues to deteriorate. Every day, the buildings around me look older, decrepit, crumbling, seeming to fade from existence. Paint peeling, windows covered in grime, or broken. The sidewalks are cracked, and even my own apartment building looks like 50 years have passed with no maintenance. On day 10, the internet stopped working. I can't make any calls from my phone other than the one I made on that day, where I called my mother. I listen to her voice, and I sob every day, knowing that no matter how many times I beg for her help, she can't hear the current me. Only the ghost of who I was on the 28th speaks to her. I never did get to travel to New York to see my parents again, and I'll forever regret it. There's no going back home. Ever. The people I see walking by on the street move more slowly now, shambling, stuttering footsteps, feet dragging along the ground. 
whatever residual energy animated them before, seems to be dwindling. Some of them are missing flesh, bone showing through on their faces where skin and muscle should be. It should scare me more than it does, but at this point, I don't care anymore. Despite being fed and watered daily, my cats have regressed to a feral stage I know they'll never recover from. When I got home today, I did the only humane thing I could think to do. I opened the back door and let them run free. They scurried out without even a backward glance. I can only hope that they can find some peace or to be released from whatever this hellish Groundhog Day is. There's nothing more I can do for them. I've been thinking for a few days, and I came across my only potential solution. My only option to get out of this godforsaken time loop. I don't care if I go to heaven or hell. I was never very religious anyway, but I've been standing here for the last hour, unable to believe that the timeline hasn't somehow tossed me back to my apartment and where I should be right now at this very moment. The sky has been dark for about an hour, but it's only dinner time. The sun always sets early here in the winter. The air around me is bitterly cold, the wind biting, but somehow silent. Everything around me is peaceful and muffled, even though the air this high up on the bridge should be howling so loud that it obliterates all other sounds. If the only thing that I can force off the track of this day is my own body, the only solution is to jump off this bridge and hope that my death here will send my soul elsewhere. I'm certain it's not my body trapped here, but somehow my soul is in this purgatory of a snowy day in December that there's no escaping from. I strip off my winter jacket and my shoes, climbing onto the railing that looks out over the water. In the low light, the constantly shifting fluid of the port nearly looks black, more like oil than water. I start to shiver, and decide there's no need to prolong the inevitable. None of the cars driving past me on the bridge even slow down as I leap off the edge, suspended in the open air for what feels like hours. I hit the frigid water and my body goes numb almost instantly from the drop in temperature and the stinging force of the impact. I don't try to find the surface, even as my body struggles and my lungs fill with fluid, the bubbles around me telling me which way to go if only I were truly seeking the surface. My flailing ceases, and everything around me is calm, at last. The quiet envelops me as I drift in the icy water, and I let my eyelids slide shut. Please, I murmur, the whole of existence around me being swallowed by the dark abyss of nothingness. December 28th, 2021 Day 14 My dog joined a cult by Spooky Dude 43, narrated by 242 from 242 Reads. I wish I never moved into the city. Don't get me wrong, it's nice to be closer to work, and there's so much more you can do here. In the countryside, it was a 15 minute drive to find some place to eat, and a 30 minute drive to the nearest grocery store. Nothing was even open past 8 p.m., but here, I could leave work at 11 p.m. and find myself a movie theater or a restaurant right across the street. I was loving it. My dog, however, was less than thrilled. Shelby was a good girl, some sort of retriever. Almost golden, but not quite. Closer to a reddish brown. She had long, fluffy ears that would swing and sway as she ran, and a tail that would never stop wagging. But ever since we moved, she hasn't been the same. Eating less, sleeping more, 
signs enough for me to get worried. My concerns reached new heights when she started to run away. The first night she ran, I was belligerent. I wandered through the streets trying to call her name and explain to the officers on the phone what had happened at the same time. For three hours I searched, only returning home because it was dark, and the police had promised me that they would look for her. When I returned home that night and found her patiently waiting at the front door, I was not ashamed to admit I cried a little. There was no scolding, no anger. I was just happy to have her back. Then she ran away again. It became routine. Every week she would run away at least once, sometimes twice, only to return at my door a few hours later, waiting to be let inside. I scoured the house for any hole, crack, or crevice she could have been slipping out through, but found nothing. It was as if she was simply turning the lock and walking out, closing the door behind her. My friends recommended a shock collar to keep her in check, but I could never do that to her, though it did give me an idea. I fixed a little GPS to her collar, the kind they sell for keeping track of cats and dogs, and waited. It didn't take long for her to run away again, and I sat in my car prepared to follow her. I was stopped by a sudden realization. She's been happier, hasn't she? Ever since she started running away, her attitude has done a 180. She sleeps less, wakes her tail more, and just seems to be in a generally better mood. I figured she just needed a chance to run around and stretch her legs, but I knew that sooner or later she would get hurt. So I started to follow the signal. As my car went from pleasantly lit streets to rolling down dark, graveled alleyways, I started to sweat. What was she doing down here? I figured I'd find her at a park or someone else's yard bothering their cat. Not in some dark alley. Eventually, I reached a narrow path and had to get out of my car to travel it. Shimmering past a rusty chain-link fence and into... someone's backyard? Sat surrounded by tall brick walls was a little green lot, bushes and trees around the edge with a clear, unobstructed center. It was such an odd spot for a plot like this, like a tiny park wedged between buildings. The only way in or out was through that little chain fence. I peered past the bushes, and just beyond them in the center of the lot with four other dogs was my Shelby. I quickly pulled out my phone and took a few pictures. It was so cute to see my dog sneaking off to play with friends. Like something out of a Pixar movie. I stood up, no longer trying to hide, and looked around the lot for anyone who might own the other dogs. There was no one else around. Just me and the dogs. I stepped out of the bushes towards them and froze. Something was off. Shelby always jumps on me to greet me, but now she stood statue still staring at me. All of them did, actually. Not a single one of them moved an inch other than their eyes, which followed me as I approached, just looking at me, heads low to the ground, tails stiff as stone. They looked like they should have been growling but none of them made a sound. Shelby? I called hesitantly, but she didn't respond. I reached out to touch her, about to pat her head, but stopped myself. I felt so sure that if I touched her then, something would happen. My gut told me to leave, but I didn't want to go without my dog. Shelby, come on. I pleaded, but she only stared at me. I left, squeezing past the fence, getting in my car and driving home. As I drove, I thought about what I should do. She would be back, right? She always came back, always happy as can be. Would she be like that again, or would she be somehow she was in that alley? 
Maybe she just thought she was in trouble or didn't like that I found her secret spot. Though that wasn't like her. She would be fine once she came home, I decided. I just needed to wait. Hours rolled by at a snail's pace. I tried playing video games, reading, listening to music, anything to distract myself from my thoughts, but I couldn't stop worrying about Shelby. Each tick of the clock sounded like her nails on the concrete floor outside. Every bark had me checking out my window to see if it was her coming home. Finally, around 1am I fell asleep. In my dreams, I was in an alley again, walking towards the lot. It was dark out and I couldn't see past the fence. But as I got near, I could hear growling. And soon I saw two glowing yellow eyes staring at me from outside. Slowly raising high and higher until whatever they belonged to stepped over the fence and began to come towards me. I sat up on the couch, rubbing my eyes and looking around my living room. It was still dark. A look at my phone told me it was 3.01 a.m. And I sighed, staying up and preparing to go to the bedroom when I heard something. My body went stiff, ears straining to catch the sound again, eyes wide as I slowly spun, searching the room for the source of the sound. It had sound like an exhale, sharp, fast, and close. I nearly jumped out of my skin when someone pounded on the front door. Who is it? I called as I pressed my eye to the people, but I saw no one, and no one answered. I waited for a long time, listening hard and staring through that hole into the night outside when finally someone knocked again. I didn't see their face or body, but what I did see is their hand raise up and strike the door three times. I said, who is it? I called again, more aggressive this time. Whoever was outside, I wanted them to think I wasn't some pushover. Hopefully they would leave me alone. They still didn't answer but I began to hear movement outside the door, a scratching sound like nails scraping against concrete. And for a moment, my eyes went wide. I dropped to my knees, pressing my cheek against the ground and checking under the door. There in front of me, sniffing hard like she just caught my scent, was my big reddish-brown snoot of a dog. My dog. I yanked the door open hard, arms already out and ready for Shelby to jump up into them. But there was nothing on the other side. Shelby? I called out in confusion, stepping outside, looking around, seeing nothing. There's no way I imagined that. It was right there. But I sighed, realizing just how tired I was, how sore my eyes were and how desperately I need sleep. I'll go back to the alley tomorrow. She'll turn up. I thought, trying not to think about her scared and alone, wandering the night looking for me, wondering why I hadn't found her yet. I couldn't sleep. Looking through old photos helped a little. It was nice to see her running through the fields of my old home. God, I miss it. I scrolled through every picture until I got to the most recent one, the picture of her and the other dogs. Smiling, I prepared to set it down when I noticed something strange. There was a sort of pattern to the grass. I thought I was imagining it at first, but the longer I looked, the clearer I saw it. It was like something was under the grass. The lawn seemed to bulge in lines, lines that formed a circle around the dogs, with bits of building ground running between and around them in that circle. It was easy to write off as the natural bumpy dirt under the lawn, but something felt so deliberate about it. Have you ever seen those pictures online? The ones the artists write, the longer you look, the stranger it gets under. 
I felt like I was looking at one of those. Every time my eyes wandered, I noticed something else off about the picture. Two birds in the trees I had missed before hung dead. Bits of stringy rope tied around their feet to keep them suspended in the trees. The brick walls in the background seemed to have drawings carved into their surfaces. Between the dogs, half hidden in the grass, was something red and white. And finally, Shelby's eyes were a different color than their usual brown. They were yellow. A knock on the door nearly made me throw my phone. I sat up slowly. Something was weird about this knock. It sounded closer. It came again, louder this time, and I felt my body start to shake like my door had when they pounded on it. Someone was in my house, and they were knocking on my bedroom door. I slowly crept out of bed, preparing to run into the bathroom and call 911 when I heard a bark from the other side of the door. I rushed to open it, stepping out into my living room and looked around. Standing in the corner of the room, obscured in shadow, was what looked like a dog. Shelby? I asked, voice shaking with fear. Shelby... It called back. Its voice was wobbly, pitched much too high, like it had to squeeze the words out. I froze in my tracks when it spoke, and could only stare in horror as it slowly stood up on its back legs and began to step towards me. It looked like something had taken my dog's skin and stretched it over its frame, but it wasn't a very good fit. Parts of its skin sag and hung low, while other parts were too tight, starting to tear and seep blood. Along with thin, dangling appendages, its mouth hung open and it seemed like its true face was watching me from inside. Parts of its body seemed to be moving under the skin, pushing against it, trying to pry through it. It towered over me, at least seven feet tall lowering its face inches from mine and sniffing at me a few times. Through Shelby's ajarred mouth, I could see things moving, something wet and dark that seemed to be stretching out towards me, like a hand with a hundred fingers all crawling along her throat. I stepped back and slammed my bedroom door in its face, turning the lock even though it didn't sound like it was trying to get in. It just kept saying her name, over and over as I flung open my window and crawled out. The last thing I saw before I dropped to the ground was her snout, pressing under the doorframe and sniffing for me. I'm at my friend's house now. I ran to the nearest gas station and had her come pick me up. I didn't tell her much, just that something was in my house and I needed a place to stay for the night. She was understanding and didn't try to pry. I'm typing this up on her laptop because I don't want to forget or convince myself it didn't happen. I know what I saw, and I know something took Shelby from me. And tomorrow, I'm going back to that alley to find out what. Normally, I don't pick up hitchhikers. By rule, I don't think it's worth the risk when, if someone truly needs a ride, they can call an Uber or Lyft and be off in 10 minutes. However, while on a quick snack run last month, I made the mistake of breaking my rule when I approached a young woman who was walking alone in the pouring rain. At first, I fully intended to drive by as I would have with any other person. She must have noticed me driving up, because right as I came up on her, she spun around, nearly jumped in front of my car, and frantically waved her arms for me to stop. As I screeched to a halt, she ran up to my driver's side window and started on a tangent about how her phone died and how she was still six miles away from home. Her face was obstructed by a mask, oversized hat, and dark glasses, so I couldn't glean any semblance of sincerity from her facial expressions. 
but I could hear the desperation in her voice. Dumb of a decision as it was, I didn't feel right letting her walk home in the rain without a phone when she was clearly begging for help. This is on top of the fact that I didn't exactly have anywhere else to be at 1am. I opened the door, and almost as soon as she entered the car, she asked for me to go straight. As I drove, I tried to make conversation with the stranger, but I never could get an actual response. The only reply I'd received was, I'd like to go home. Please help me get home. Eventually, I just gave up entirely. After around 10 minutes of driving straight, I asked if I was supposed to be turning anywhere but was met with silence. I turned toward the woman for a brief moment to repeat my question, but instead slammed on the brakes when I laid eyes on her. All the items covering her face had been removed to reveal a completely smooth surface. The only hint at some approximation of a face was the slight rise and fall of veiny skin where her mouth would have been, almost as if she was imitating breathing. Instinctually, I put the car into park and moved to run out, but before I could even touch the handle, a large hand clamped around my arm and held me in place. I was close to having a full-blown panic attack, but she raised a gnarled finger to non-existent lips and made a quiet shh sound. When she spoke, her voice had taken on a much more gravelly tone, and the pressure from her vice grip forced me to take every word with the utmost respect. You will not leave, she stated. You must drive. You no longer have a choice. When she released her grip, I didn't say a word. I didn't even want to comment on the apparent bruising on my arm for fear she'd do much worse if I complained. I simply exhaled, put the car into drive, and kept going. We must have driven for another half hour. She'd occasionally tell me to make a turn here or there. Still, after about 15 minutes, I knew we were headed toward the more rural parts of the county, an area where people were known to go missing. With every glance in her direction, I could see her featureless face was trained on me. It was as if she was observing me. Not entirely sure of whether or not she could trust I'd take her wherever she wanted to go. And as soon as that trust was broken, it would very quickly be over for me. Eventually, she instructed me to pull up to a lone, run-down house just off the highway. The windows were boarded up, and I could see piles of trash strewn about the exterior. When we stopped in front of it, she told me to get out. An unconscious shake of my head prompted her to slam her giant fist on the dashboard, cracking the plastic. Without argument, I walked out into the cold night. She followed behind and pointed at the house. In silence, we walked into the decaying building and were immediately met with a groan. I shined my phone's flashlight forward and saw what appeared to be a homeless man writhing around on the ground in pain. He was foaming at the mouth, and his eyes were bloodshot. I gasped and took a step back onto some glass which alerted him to our presence. He turned to me and begged for help. He begged for me to call an ambulance or at least take a message for his kids. He began rambling about how he'd made a colossal mistake, and unfortunately, he, he never got to finish what he was saying. The woman pounced. In the blink of an eye, she was on top of him, her hand contorted into a claw that wrapped entirely around his face. Thirteen grotesquely long fingers held his head down as he struggled against her ungodly strength. He tried to fight back, but the weak man's struggles were met with even more force. The creature upon him was determined to lap up every last breath, and I swore I could hear a twisted chuckle as it watched him cling to life. The screams seemed like they went on forever, but in reality, it was quick. Maybe thirty seconds had passed, and he was gone. 
When she retracted from the body, a quick shine of my phone's light revealed a broken jaw, a twisted nose, and deep bruising around the neck. The woman faced away from me, and for a moment, we both just stood there in that horrible place. I tried to find my voice. I wanted nothing more than the strength to tell her that all I wanted was to go home and pretend like that night was all a nightmare. But I didn't have to. Reminiscent of the way she turned to me on that dark, rainy road, she spun around and revealed not just a large smile, but a brand new face, one that greatly resembled that of the man she had just taken from this world. Her parting words to me in his voice were, Thank you very much. Never return here. With that, she simply walked further into the decaying structure, as soon as she was out of sight, I sprinted back to my car and sped all the way home. That night, I must have quadruple-checked all the locks, taped the curtains down, and left a pile of makeshift weapons by my bed. Every single dream I had for the next month consisted not just of visions of her, but of many more creatures like her. And honestly, despite it all, I still never wanted to tell anyone. I want nothing less than to be another random guy throwing a story in the sea of tall tales. I knew that anyone I told this to would roll their eyes and tell me that I'm being ridiculous or that I needed to be drug tested. I'd rather just avoid the scrutiny entirely. But just last week, a man was found dead in his home, clearly suffocated, jaw and nose broken. No tips had led to anything significant. The police's only hint is of a crappy video of some young man who was described as appearing featureless being dropped off near the home. Funnily enough, just last night, I saw a post on one of those community apps saying that someone in the area thought they saw the murdered man walking the streets. Turned out to just be a young man who looked remarkably similar to him. After hearing that story, I think I feel a little less crazy going public with this. To the man I enabled the death of, I'm so sorry. I thought I was doing something good, and as a result, it ended in tragedy. I will never forgive myself for that. I don't know what you were going through, but you deserved so much better. And to the world at large, if you're ever in a situation where someone is trying to hitchhike with you, please keep driving. I know most of you out there will think this is a hoax, or that I'm just some woman trying to gain internet fame, but let me assure you, that is not the case. I don't even know where to begin, really. I will try to start at the beginning, but you see, my mind isn't as sharp as it once was. October 22nd, 2016 I moved into a cute, secluded house. You're probably thinking, oh great, another haunted house story. But no, you would be mistaken. That is not where this story is going. As I was saying, I moved into a new house in a very secluded area. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and as far as I knew... There weren't any deaths that happened in or around the home. I did my research. As a single woman, you can never be too careful. The previous owner was an old woman, perhaps a widow or a spinster. I only saw one name when I looked up the address. She passed away of natural causes at the local old folks' home. It was called Willow Tree Senior Living. I couldn't find too much on the place. See? I researched. No deaths in the house. The owner before that was also an older woman, also a widow or a spinster. I hope this isn't a pattern and I end up living out my days as a lonely old woman in this house. But I digress. It seemed too good to be true at the time. The only stipulation my realtor had given me was that at no point in time was I ever allowed to cut down the horrific-looking tree that peered into my bedroom window. I thought to myself, well, what an odd clause. And without probing any further, 
sign my name on the dotted line. But maybe I should have trusted my instincts. Upon settling in, I don't recall any weird instances. No odd smells coming from the basement or anything like that. Life was good and I was truly happy. October 22nd, 2017. A year had gone by and I finally made my house my own. New floors were installed and a fresh coat of paint gave the house new light. I even knocked down a few walls to give it that open floor plan that I've always seen on the Home Network channel. Chip and Joanna Gaines would be so proud of me. It was perfect. On the inside, anyways. I just really hated that tree. The more I saw it, the more I wish I would have asked more about it and why I wasn't allowed to remove it. It must have been some historical something or other, I don't know. Every night, I would stare at it before bed. It was as if I couldn't look away no matter how hard I tried. I installed window treatments, but even the drapes could not help. The shadowy outline of the tree taunted me. It was an eyesore that I couldn't get rid of. Then, things started to get weird. October 23rd, 2017 I woke up feeling particularly tired that day. I looked like I hadn't slept in days and I was drained. That's the best way I could describe it. Drained. I remember having an odd dream that night about that stupid fucking tree. Great. Now it's even taunting me in dreamland. I need to stop looking at it right before bed, I thought to myself. The dream was so vivid, it seemed as if it wasn't a dream at all. I could picture every detail so clear in my mind. I was wearing a white nightgown, like something out of the 17th century, definitely not my style. I was surrounded by men or women maybe, I really couldn't tell. It was hard to tell as they were all wearing hooded black cloaks. The hooded figures formed a pattern of some kind, not a circle, not a square, maybe more like a diamond or um, a star? Yeah, I'm quite positive it was a star. The fire they were surrounding was roaring, but the smoke was an odd color. It wasn't like any color I've ever seen coming from a bonfire anyways. It was more of a dull purple. The tree was always there. Except in the dreams, the tree had some sort of decorations hanging from it. The hooded figures were always so fixated on the tree. But me? I was scared. I was terrified. I was so close to the fire, I was perspiring. Even though it was only a dream, I remember feeling the sweat dripping from my forehead down to my upper lip. I was terrified. I felt paralyzed. As I stood there, unable to move or speak, I realized the figures were chanting something. It was some otherworldly language that I could not for the life of me understand. I kept trying to speak and ask them what they wanted, why they were saying what they were saying, but they looked straight through me, as though I wasn't even there. Not knowing what else to do, I pinched myself. I pinched myself so hard that when I woke up, I had a bruise in the exact same spot. I must have done it to myself in real life too. I had wondered if I was so tired because my mind was running wild all night and it didn't allow my brain to have peaceful, tranquil dreams. When I finally woke up, I put on an extra bold pot of coffee and stared at myself in the mirror. Jeez, I really need a better eye cream. And is that a gray hair? I know I haven't been that stressed at work. I guess this is what getting older entails. October 24th through 30th, 2017 the same dream. The same fucking dream every night. No, it's not a dream. It's a nightmare. Over and over. The bruises on my arm from these pinches are now alarming me. My entire arm is covered in purplish yellow bruising and my eyes, my eyes are so tired. They look tired. They feel tired. I, I do not want to close them in fear of falling asleep. There are more gray hairs than black covering my head at this point, 
This can't be normal for a 26-year-old, I don't think. The more I sleep, the older I look the next day. At first, I thought it was just part of getting older, but this... This, my friends, this is not normal. Something is draining the life out of me. I can barely function at work. Coffee, energy drinks, nothing is keeping me from dozing off. Whenever I close my eyes, I see it replaying in my mind. The hooded figures, the purple smoke, the tree. Then, I hear it. The chanting. The crackling of the fire. My tired voice trying to get their attention. This can't be right. Morning of October 31st. Halloween night. One of my most hated nights of the year. I loved how secluded I was. No need to buy candy. I highly doubted that anyone would bring their children into this neck of the woods. I was trying hard not to fall asleep but found it very difficult to resist the temptation of my bed. Maybe if I just close my eyes for five minutes and set an alarm, I won't have the nightmare. Evening of October 31st. Wait, what's that? Oh my god, I slept a full hour and no nightmare? Is it over? Can I sleep like a normal human being now? Pure excitement flooded my thoughts. As I walked into my living room, I didn't bother to look out the window. Instead, I just yelled, Sorry, no candy, kiddos. My voice sounded odd. It must have been because I had just woken up. Seriously, kids, I don't have any candy. Holy shit, these kids are relentless. Storming to the door, I was ready to tell them once again I had no candy. As I went to the door, I caught a glimpse of myself in the entryway mirror. What I saw in that mirror could not have been true. This couldn't be me. Horrified by the sight, I stumbled and tripped. I looked down at my hands to see not those of a young woman, but wrinkled hands with rotting fingernails. My hair. My hair was completely white. It was long and straggly, no longer the neat black hair I usually kept. I tried to speak, but nothing would come out. I felt paralyzed. I felt like I did in that nightmare. I mustered up all my strength and tried to pinch myself. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! From the window, I could see purple smoke and hear the chanting. This couldn't be real. Wake up! Wake up! With the little strength I regained, I pinched myself as hard as I could. Nothing. I was still seeing the smoke. I was still unable to speak. I was frozen. The hooded figures were no longer surrounding the fire. They were pounding harder and harder on my door. I slid my body across the floor and managed to reach my cell phone. It took all I had in me, but I managed to dial 911. October 31st, 2019 It has been two years since I left that house and that godforsaken tree. Two years that I've been locked away in this facility. When the cops found me, I was nothing but a crazy old woman telling a story about a tree that took my youth. They never found the young woman who lived in the house, so they pinned her disappearance on me. They said I must have drowned her in the lake, me, a feeble old woman drowning someone in a lake. It didn't make much sense to me either. They had no proof, so they couldn't lock me away in a prison cell, so here I am. The tree, however, it's never left me. The more I sleep, the older I get. I, too, shall live out the last of my days at Willow Tree Psychiatric Center, like the owners of the house before me. I must have done my research incorrectly. From what I've read, the house remains unoccupied, but I hope, no, I pray, that the next owner chops down that tree, or else... They'll end up withering away, like me. Ghost Drivers in Fancy Cars Story by you slash my GF made this. 
I drive the same back road in town a lot. Never had anything unusual happen on this drive. Until several months ago, February 2021. I was driving to pick up my girlfriend from work like I do every day. From our apartment, I prefer to take the back road I mentioned earlier. The road is shaded by tree canopies and these, like, hidden driveways that lead to some really beautiful houses and farms. I'm not much of a car person, but one of the houses on that street has a really nice classic car that's always parked in its driveway. Pretty sure they never take the thing out at all. It's almost white, more eggshell than anything, and its tires are white and black, like none I've ever seen. Usually I sort of slow down as I drive by if I can remember it's coming up, just to look at the thing. My girl feels the same way. Well, one moment, I'm driving, passing the house, and I turn to look up at the car, which is sitting in the driveway. Now, out of the corner of my eye, I see what looks like headlights coming right for me. I turn, and sure enough, the same car sitting in that driveway is heading right for me. I immediately pull off to the right, slamming on my brakes and looking in the rear view to see the car that almost killed me. But there's no car. The road stretches long, and there's no car in sight. I literally get out of the car, run across the street to the house where the fancy car lives, and it's still in the driveway. The road, the neighborhood, everything is completely quiet. I literally have no idea what just happened, and so I get back in the car and I take off to pick up my girlfriend. The rest of the way, I'm just replaying the whole thing in my head. By the time I see my girlfriend... She's already suspicious that I'm pretty distracted. So after hearing about her day, she asks me about me, basically saying, what's up? I tell her what happened and she's super spooked by the story, asking me to be serious. And when she's convinced that I am, she tells me that we have to find out who owns that car. I wasn't sure how we were going to do that or why it mattered, but my girlfriend's one of those people who just feels things, if that makes sense. Like when she makes a move on anything, she's usually right about the outcome. We joke often that she's a witch or something. So anyway, we decide to stop by the house with the car. It's about 6.30 p.m., and I'm going on about how they're probably eating dinner, and she tells me, no, they aren't. We ring the doorbell, and to the front door comes a woman who's dressed in a nursing outfit. She's asking if she can help us, and before I can say anything, my girlfriend asks, That car, are you the owner? It's beautiful. The nurse introduces herself as Mary, and tells us that the car belongs to her boss, and she says it actually belonged to her boss's husband, but he's since passed away. I can't remember the name she gave or if I should even post it here, but she tells us the wife, her boss, can't drive, so the car just sits here, and that every time they've tried to sell the car, it just wouldn't start. Only when no buyers were around did the car start up perfectly fine. We thanked Mary for her time, and we headed back to our car. I was sort of awestruck that something came out of this little pit stop we made. My girlfriend just smiled and told me, That man definitely tried to run you off the road. I asked why in the heck would he want to do that. And she told me, It's your infatuation with that car. You slow down to look at it almost every day. I think you make him nervous. Nervous? Well... He almost killed me or whatever, so I don't know about that guy. Maybe he's not so nice. And his car, as nice as it is, it's definitely haunted. I had a strange sensation on my wrist. I was dreaming for sure. In the dream... 
I was sitting in a chair. The chair sprouted vines whenever I tried to get up. And the vines wrapped around me, pulling me into the chair tiger and tiger until I could barely breathe. I felt restricted, and I felt tears coming to my eyes. This nightmare was terrifying, so I did what any normal person does in a situation like that, and I willed myself to wake up. I woke up with the tears fresh in my eyes, and I looked around, but this couldn't be real. The walls were gray and made of stone. I was in some strange kind of cell. I was strapped to a chair. I had leather straps binding me to the chair, straps around my body, and a cap on my head holding me to the chair. Now I understood the dream. I was in an electric chair. I had no idea how I ended up here. Maybe it was amnesia or something because I had no recollection of previous events. Leading up to me being in this very chair, I sobbed and held my head down. I didn't want to die like this. The thought of being shocked, alive, while my skin burnt to a crisp, with jolts running through my body, terrified me. My life was about to end because of my fear of lightning. Help! I shouldn't be here! Somebody help! I yelled in agony, hoping someone would hear me. The strangest thing about this all wasn't the fact that I was strapped to this chair with no memory. It was that the cell had no door, just walls with no openings. I swallowed out of fear and cloaked. Hello? No answer. Five minutes passed with sweat slowly forming at the top of my forehead and dripping down the end of my chin before the footsteps receded into the distance. I closed my eyes and drifted back off to sleep. I woke up moments later when my hair rose on my neck. I felt like something was breathing on my neck. I didn't know how it had entered the room. I slowly spun around by whatever was breathing droplets on my neck to see the sight of a ghastly white face that had no eyes, no ears, and no nose. It had just a mouth with flowers of skin stretching to the top and bottom of its mouth as if it had putty for a mouth, and a toddler had stretched its mouth open. It let out a grisly stench as it spoke. Your time has come. It is time to pay for your time on Earth. It held up a mirror, and I gasped at the sight. That couldn't be me. This had to be a mistake. I looked nothing like that. Staring back at me was an old, decrepit old man who clearly had reached the end of the road. I had no memories, but I sure as hell didn't feel like I was old. This has to be a mistake. That isn't me. The creature roared. Shut up. I am growing real tired of you. What you see is you. 
You have committed horrible acts on Earth. We wipe everyone's mind on entry. Here you will be shown your life on loop and shocked for eternity by this electric chair. You will feel like you're going to die. So close to the brink of death. But you will never, ever, ever die here. This is your own personal hell. With that, the creature wheeled me out to the center of the room and shut off the lights. The creature clipped out of existence as if it was never there. I sat there, wide-eyed, and then sobbed. I don't know how long I've been down here. Days? Weeks? Months? Minutes? The amount of time doesn't matter. What matters is I've been down here much longer than I should have and I need to get out of here one way or another. The only problem is I have only one way out and for some reason I keep coming back. I can barely remember how I got down here. Maybe I stumbled and fell down a hole? Maybe I was kidnapped and held down here. None of that matters either. All that matters is that I can remember it all. And all I can remember is him. That sick monster and his evil eyes that hide behind a disgusting mask. The mask is covered in old blood and is stained from a lot of use. He comes in with his old rusted blade and spoon and does... <sighs> horrible things to me. I wish I could find some hope of freedom. I just want to breathe a breath of fresh air and be free. Is that too much to ask? For freedom will come in the form of a breath of fresh air. Freedom for me will come in the form of my death rattle. For as long as I can remember, this man with the twisted spoon and broken rabbit mask has always come down a long hallway in a dark wet tunnel where I stay at the end of it. All I can see beyond my dirty hair and the bloody leaves on me is wet stone walls and a wooden door with an opening at the end that he uses to see me through. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, but I can't seem to reach it. He has me chained to the wall at the end of this tunnel. No matter how much I would tug or pull, all it ever did was tear into my flesh. Whoever this man was did not matter. What mattered was that he would not let me leave. He would make his way into my narrow room quite often. I have no framework by which to tell when he would come in, but I could always tell he would come in a lot. Every time he would come in, he would always come in with some new way to torture me. I could tell that he enjoyed it. He has a deep rasp and a deeper tone of voice, and he always had a grin beneath that partially broken mask. I could see it just at the edge of the mask, and I could see the way the lines around his eyes behind the mask would crease. He truly enjoyed what he was doing to me, and never ceased in finding new ways to have fun with me. The problem for me was that no matter how hard I tried, I could not seem to leave. Not even in my death could I find peace. It seemed like every time I would have a visit from him. I saw him leave. I would regain a sense of energy after his departure. He was toying with me. But why? What could compel a man to do something like this to anyone is beyond me. But that question does not seem further away from an escape. No, escape is nothing more than a dream for me. Finding an escape from this nightmare full of terror and bloodshed would be a greater gift than anything else I could receive. Nothing would compare that I not have to feel the metal wrapped around my ankles and wrists, and the metal knife as it ripped through my neck every time he would come in to visit me. It seems as if my mind, my body and my spirit are trapped down here. Not even death 
seems to serve as a means of escape. Every means by which you could have imagined of dispatching a person with it, he's done it. Every possible way you could kill someone, he's done it to me. And no matter what he does, he makes sure to slip my throat and collect my blood in a dirty white cup that has been stained brown with blood. As my eyes close, I would see and feel him rake his twisted spoon up against my neck to taste the remainder of what would not fill his cup. He would pull his mask back slightly and take a taste of my blood with his twisted spoon. The light from that single light bulb would always shine just enough light for me to be able to see his smile and the black iris in his eye, like the soulless eyes of a monster. His disgusting acts always held a somewhat distinguished demeanour. Somehow, behind that mask and his blood-stained apron and pants, I could tell that the walk and movement of a gentleman exists. Somehow though, this man saw fit to keep me caged against the wall of this dark room to keep me from my blood. To what ends he would use my blood, I would never know. All I know is that my last hope of escape came when he came in with a large axe. This time I told him to take my head with him. My hope was that maybe if my head were to leave this room, maybe I would be able to leave in peace. This was before the spoon became twisted. He did as I asked and chopped my head off. He collected the blood and tasted it with the spoon. I had a few brief seconds that were filled with searing pain and a sense of choking. I tried to breathe in, but there was no means by which to stop the blood from pouring out of me. And for my brain to gain a second wind, I was slowly fading, but my eyes flitted with hope as he carried my head out. However, he realized what my plan was of escape, and turned to me with a sense of anger before he smiled his twisted smile at me again. All before I heard his spoon plunge into my left eye with the words, Nice try! And like that, I was back, chained to the end of the room, and left with no way out. Since that day, his spoon that he comes to sip my blood with has been twisted much like his soul. He comes in frequently now, always coming in with the same attire and his knife to cut my neck open, the twisted spoon to taste the blood, and the mask so my look of fear of despair would not taint his grinning face. I have been left with no hope of escape and no way out. All I hope is for my death rattle to come. I long for nothing but my death and peace. Dear God, what have I done to deserve this? I can, I can hear him coming. If mercy does not exist, may it be that I die this time. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember, your fear feeds me.